So in the last video we talked about how scientists used their knowledge of the process of genetics and evolution to try to extrapolate how long certain evolutionary steps took to, to, to occur. And they used calibration with, against other types of dating such as the fossil record and, and also other types of geological and climatological evidence to actually calibrate this clock and basically look at the amount of DNA or protein-based pair differences to actually realize how long it takes for a certain um, process to have taken place. So if we know how long it takes for a certain number of mutations to gather and then you calculate the number of DNA pair differences that exist or the number of amino acid differences that exist in a protein product, you can actually use that to figure out how long ago the DNA process took place. They say for example, if I know that a piece of bread is eaten by the household every day and then I know that this bread it will be 20 pieces long uh, or 20 pieces big and you actually put a week later you come back and you see oh there's there's uh, eight pieces behind left you know that eight days went by and so you can you it's kind of like the same principle you can use the, the bread almost like a calendar and that's exactly what they do with evolution if you know that it takes a certain amount of time for a certain number of DNA pair differences to occur because of the way the machinery of the DNA copy process and evolution actually works you can then calculate how long it takes for a certain percentage of differences to exist between the two protein products or DNA products that you are examining and that's the rationale between for dating but there are some limitations of that and before we talked about that this process is then used to separate life into four major time frames one time frame is what we call the Cenozoic and that's the most recent uh, time frame that includes the evolution of humans towards the very end of the Cenozoic and the Cenozoic started about 65 million years ago with the extinction of the dinosaurs in a great mass extinction event and ever since then several fluctuations in climate have occurred uh, alternation between ice ages and global warming periods and towards the very end of that uh, around 100,000 years ago uh, the last human species or uh, human sapiens sapiens evolved and now modern civilization before that Cenozoic therefore is the era of the mammals and before that it was the era of the dinosaurs through which the, the mammals and other birds actually evolved but they wouldn't become you know mainstream until the Cenozoic when um, the dinosaurs went extinct and Mesozoic is also when plants like uh, angiosperms evolved and that's going to start with the destruction of Pangaea around 250 million years to 300 million years ago and when Pangaea broke apart that led to a lot of cataclysmic uh, uh, mass extinction events which ended the Permian period which uh, is the last period of Paleozoic but the Mesozoic includes the Triassic, the Jurassic and the Cretaceous period which are going to be the era of the dinosaurs mostly and during that area you, like I said you have the evolution of, of, of the mammals and evolution of the angiosperms and evolution of the early birds as well modern birds would, and primates would evolve at the end of that and towards more towards the Cenozoic era before the Mesozoic era you have the Paleozoic era and that was a very very long era of the earth it started around 500 to 550 million years ago with the end of the of the of the pre-Cambrian time so Paleozoic starts as Cambrian time and it made and advancements of actual vertebrate life that shows up at the end of that with the great Cambrian explosion of life that occurred once the vertebrates actually evolved and before then life was pretty much mostly confined to the water and it's with the evolution of, of vertebrates that you're going to get things like uh, animals starting to go into the water especially after the first arthropods and amphibians also went into the water some smaller mo molluscs also went to the land you know now the Pale Paleozoic era is basically going to be uh, including a lot of the major evolutionary steps including the evolution of all vertebrates all uh, things like uh, coniferous trees and ferns and other kinds of land plants like mosses so after you have mosses that's when the arthropods are allowed, can follow and go into the land and live off the land and then you have amphibians following them eventually when the vertebrates evolved from the fish and several different areas are going to exist here on the on the Paleozoic including Cambrian time including the Carboniferous time uh, including the, the Ordovician, Devonian, Silurian, 
and also the Permian period. So we talk more about this when we do the history of life earlier in the year. Now before that period, you also have invertebrate life and a lot of water plants and also eukaryotic cells and all the types of multicellular organisms living in the water. And that's what we call the Precambrian time, which is split by science in two major eons. The, proto the Proterozoic eon includes the evolution of uh, multicellular eukaryotes and before then single cell eukaryotes like the protists. And then before that, you also have the development of algae and other cyanobacteria, which are going to be doing photosynthesis, and they're going to be enriching the atmosphere with modern oxygen until actually somewhere into the Paleozoic and the Ordovician, uh, the atmosphere finally reaches modern levels of oxygen, allowing the life to actually go into the land. And before that, you have the Archean Eon, which includes the evolution of prokaryotic life, including archaeobacteria and eobacteria. And these were the first one life to show up on Earth. So that's when you go from the origin of the solar system all the way to the evolution of the first life on Earth. And you go to the first geological and atmospheric events and formation processes. So this history of life is all figured out through the process of you know, geology and things like that. But the timing of life steps in this evolutionary process is made by molecular clocking. And through the molecular clocking, we create things like this, cladograms and... Uh, also phylogenic trees which include branches with proportional branch lengths. For example, you see in this branch that if you look at the ignata, which is a type of fish, it probably evolved a very, very long time ago, around uh, 580 million years ago to be precise, because this is how long the that branch has the, is split from the other branches that went on to become higher order mammals. So. The higher order mammals, including the primates, must have evolved less than 100 million years ago because that's how long the derived character seems to take place. So you see that this particular cladogram, whether it's not right or wrong, probably been out there by now, it's actually an example of, of this type of dating mechanism. And this has constantly changed slightly because we get better data about the molecular clocking, so we get clock calibration of the way the clocks are supposed to take. And you see here another example of this the splitting uh, tree of life that actually includes information about the time length and therefore the longer the branch is the longer you know that branch has been present in the tree of life and you can actually see when a certain derived character took place. Now this particular tree is cool because they actually look it shows you how big the D, or how much DNA each of the sex cells of these uh, organisms actually have. And it's interesting to see that sometimes organisms which are more primitive will have more DNA than organisms which are a little more advanced. And that's usually because you're going to see deletions sometimes causing the evolutionary process that uh, takes place. But either way, that's what scientists do. They look at the DNA amount of DNA and the amount of variation that exists within the DNA to create clocks. But there are some limitations of using this. And the biggest limitations are going to be the fact that a lot of the evolution process does not happen steadily, but it happens at right or variable rates or bursts, such as punctuated equilibrium events or random evolution events, especially after catastrophic events. So that means the rate of evolution is not going to be constant. That means that when you look at a molecular clock and you're looking at an estimate based on the average that's calibrated against the fossil record and other kinds of data. But that doesn't mean necessarily that all the groups of life are going to evolve according to that specific average. So it's very important for you to constantly calibrate the clock and to use better kinds of clocking mechanisms throughout time to try to figure this out. And to actually examine the differences that exist between the uh, organisms, including differences in the proofreading enzymes, which are the ones which are going to determine how fast certain DNA-based pair differences actually gather. And so you have to look at and analyze the DNA of different species to actually see, you know, how good those proofreading enzymes are and therefore use that to calibrate the clocks even further. But the thing is that, you know, some of the species that we have today, we don't have DNA for them, so it's really hard, hard to do that for very ancient species. So you have to rely on the fossil record for calibration of the, of the clocks, especially for earlier species. And the problem is that the fossil record itself is limited because you don't have fossils of every organism that's ever lived. Usually you get fossils of the most common organisms because they have a higher likelihood of being preserved or very rarely a random organism that's not very common 
is preserved. And so you don't have fossils for everything, too. Some of the fossils were never uh, destroyed by geological process, so we barely have fossils to, to represent all the diversity that has existed in the history of the Tree of Life, which is why looking at DNA libraries sometimes is a better way, but that in itself is also limited because there's so much variety in the genetic code that's very hard even for supercomputers to look at similarities or in the paralogous and orthologous genes. So finding molecular homoplasies is a very challenging thing. And so you have to constantly look at all things in conjunction, and including the, how good the proofreading enzymes are, the fossil record, and several types of molecular clocks. And the way the scientists actually use this to solve this, the advantages is that, is that they actually look at multiple genes at the same time. So in other words, they don't make a clock based on only one gene across many different organisms. They actually look at several different genes all at once and calculate the probability of similarity between organisms based on many of these genes and they get the average. So for example, let's say for one gene with 80% different, for, but for another gene with 70% different, for other, another gene with 75% different, for another gene with 76% different, and they get the average of all these genes to actually see the, the actual uh, rate at which evolution is differentiated between two sets of organisms. Now, to uh, another big problem of, of limitation for molecular clocking is natural selection itself. Because you see, the rate at which natural selection takes place is going to be different for different kinds of traits. For example, if you look at ribosomal RNA, it's going to be evolving very, very slowly because ribosomal RNA is crucial for life forms. Ribosomal RNA is a special type of RNA that's coding for or present on the ribosomes, which are protein synthesis machines. Without this RNA, we're going to be, not be able to do any of the phenotypes that, or, that the organism has. So ribosomal RNA is usually very stable because changes in ribosomal RNA usually cause severe problems for the animal and therefore the, the, they will survive. So it evolves very, very slowly because natural selection will select against any variation that severely affects the look. But other kinds of, mut of mutations might not be so pronounced if there are genes which do multiple traits, and so it might be bad for one side, but it might be good for another side. So platopic genes, also genes which are involved in epistasis, uh, or genes which are in multifactorial traits, or even genes which are neutral, are going to evolve in different rates. So that's the other thing. The traits will evolve at different ways because traits are evolved with different kinds of pressure. And so natural selection will screw up with the, with the rate at which certain genes evolve. So you can't look at different genes the same way, even though you want to look at multiple genes at the same time. Look, for example, mitochondrial DNA will evolve very, very fast because mitochondrial DNA is basically inside of a prokaryotic cell, which is not involved in DNA exchanges of Mendelian genetics or, or, or transference doing sexual reproduction. They have their own kind of mechanism that's traveled down the maternal line. We talked about this with the chromosomal inheritance. Since prokaryotic cells like this, this particular endosymbiont that lives in all of us don't have the spell check mechanisms that other eukaryotic cells do, or at least not as advanced as we do, the evolution process will have be, happen a lot faster, and they also have very hard multiplication rates. So that means that the mitochondria will evolve a lot faster. And so you can see along the maternal lines a really, really fast change in the mitochondrial DNA. So you can use mitochondrial DNA to, to time recent evolutionary steps or differences that exist between races or between species which are very similar to each other. On the other hand, a ribosomal RNA that evolves so slowly can actually be used to time evolutionary differences across long periods of time since the clock ticks very, very slowly, and that's what we actually use to separate the domains of life. We're going to talk about that later in the lecture series. So that means that genes which are crucial for survival are going to be slower at actually evolving, so it's going to be a very variable rate of evolution. But genes which are a little more neutral are going to be evolving a little faster and at a more constant rate. And so scientists tend to look at even the junk DNA more if to actually see a more neutral rates for the, for the clock. And if it's a, they want a slower rate, then they look at more a more crucial kind of trait. So I, that's basically how scientists do molecular clocking. And they all look and try to understand the specific types of mutation leading to all the variations that exist through the process of natural selection to construct trees based on the differences that exist between the DNA code. Look at this tree, for example. They analyze all the differences that exist in a certain gene to actually create what you call a phylogenetic tree of life. And when you actually look at the phylogenetic tree of life and you compare the animal's differences across many of these different traits, you can then create what we call the cladograms with branches which are proportional to represent 
the time frame that it took for the evolutionary steps to occur, how long this actual, actual species has existed, or how long this group has existed, and how long it's been since they split from the common ancestor that left between them and other groups of animals. In other words, how long ago did the derived character uh, develop in the evolutionary process. So that's molecular clocking, and I hope you learned a lot, and I'll see you in the next video. We're going to be talking about how you use uh, systematics to construct such phylogenic trees. I'll see you guys then.